everyone, happy Halloween. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Susie Leachy. I'm a certified health coach specializing in women's reproductive health, and I help women naturally balance their hormones through nutrition and lifestyle modifications. So I just wanted to pop on today to do a quick video on a women's health condition that I personally have struggled with, and I know a lot of other women have too, and that is PCOS. So I'll just give you a quick overview of what it is, what some of the common symptoms are, how to know if you have it, and what some of the treatment options are, both conventional and holistic treatment options. And if you have any questions as you're watching this, feel free to leave me a comment. And if you catch the replay and you have uh, questions at that point, you can also comment on the video or send me a message and I will get back to you. So let's just jump right in. What is PCOS? PCOS is an acronym for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And as a syndrome, by definition, it is a collection of symptoms. So not all women will experience all the symptoms, but um, a lot of them will experience some of the symptoms. So some of the more common ones are irregular or absent menstrual cycles. That's a really big one. Unwanted hair growth, especially on the upper lip and chin areas and also hair loss on the top of the head. So kind of hair where you don't want it and losing hair where you do want it. Another one is acne, also insulin resistance, mood swings, difficulty sleeping, low libido. And there are others as well, but that's, those are some of the more common symptoms. Now, how common is this condition? Well, about 10% of women in the US have PCOS and that equates to about 5 million women. So it's relatively common. And actually, aside from age, it's the most common cause of infertility. And that's also when a lot of women discover that they have this condition. Maybe they've had some of the symptoms in the past and have had irregular cycles, but it's not until they want to try to get pregnant and they're having difficulty that they discover that they um, have PCOS. So how do you know definitively if you have this condition? What are the diagnostic criteria? So in order to be officially diagnosed with PCOS, you have to have two of the following three things. So the first is absent or infrequent periods. So absent periods, that would be amenorrhea, and infrequent periods is referred to as oligomenorrhea. Next is polycystic ovaries. So you may have had a doctor tell you that on giving you an ultrasound that your ovaries look like they have a string of pearls on them. That's a classic sign of PCOS and that's where the condition gets its name from. And then the third is elevated male hormones, um, also called androgens. So that would be either testosterone or DHEAS. And again, you don't have to have all three of these criteria in order to be diagnosed, you just have to have two of the three. So interestingly enough, you don't even have to have polycystic ovaries to have PCOS. So what are some of the conventional treatment options? So you go to your doctor, what are they going to prescribe for you once they diagnose you with PCOS? So the first and probably the most common, and unfortunately this is probably the most common prescription given for all female health conditions, <laughs> hormonal health conditions, is the birth control pill. So this contains synthetic female hormones, estrogen and progesterone, and taking this pill will simulate a regular cycle so that you have a monthly bleed, but you're not actually ovulating and it's not your body's natural hormones. The next is metformin. So this is actually a diabetes medication, but it's also commonly used in PCOS because it can help with insulin resistance. And I know personally when I was diagnosed with PCOS, those were kind of the two options that I was given. They're probably the most common. So it was basically, if you're not trying to conceive right now, go on the birth control pill. And if you are, go on metformin. So I ended up not, not doing either of those at all. Get into later, but those are definitely the most common treatment options that you'll likely be given. Um, and then the next one is spironolactone. And this drug is a diuretic that's used to treat high blood pressure and heart failure, but it's also commonly prescribed in PCOS patients because it's also an anti-androgen. So again, androgens are the male hormones, so it can reduce some of those symptoms like acne and unwanted hair growth that can be caused by the high androgen levels. 
And it also dries you out, similar to Accutane, if you're familiar with that drug. So because it's an anti-androgen, it leads to less oil production, which can help with acne. And then the last conventional treatment option, it's not a medication, but commonly you'll be told to go on a low-carb diet, exercise more, and lose weight. So what are the problems with these conventional treatment options and why did I decide not to go with these options when I was, when I was given them? So the first is that medications have side effects, as we all know. And the second reason is that they don't address the underlying cause. They're basically just a band-aid to treat any symptoms that you may be having. And that brings us to what are the underlying causes of PCOS? Well, first of all, there's usually a genetic component, so it tends to run in families, and it also tends to run in families that have diabetes because of the insulin resistance component. Um, usually there's also some degree of inflammation in the body when a woman has PCOS, and there's also usually some degree of insulin resistance. And this one is a little bit tricky because your insulin resistance may not show up on a standard fasting insulin test, which is what you would be typically given. Thank you for the likes. <laughs> um, so you may not show up as insulin resistant on a standard test for insulin resistance because they're going to test just your fasting insulin level, and that might look like it's normal, but you may have a type of insulin resistance that manifests more so as blood sugar swings, either after eating or in between meals. So maybe you have kind of a more carb heavy meal and your blood sugar might spike really high and then drop off really low and then you might have symptoms of low blood sugar and that might not show up on a fasting insulin resistance test but you still have that degree of insulin resistance it's just showing up differently in your body. And also different tissues in the body can be insulin resistant or insulin sensitive. So for instance, muscle tissue can be insulin sensitive or insulin resistant and then fat tissue same thing, it can be insulin sensitive or insulin resistant. Now, there are different types of PCOS. I mean, every woman with PCOS is, is really unique, and these, aren't, these types of PCOS are not standards, but you'll hear some practitioners talk about various categories of PCOS or phenotypes. So the first and the most common that you'll probably hear about is the, the classic type of PCOS. So this applies to women who tend to gain weight around the middle due to the um, excess male hormones. So they'll gain weight more in a, a male type of pattern as opposed to uh, female, like where you gain weight on your hips, butt, thighs. They may have difficulty losing weight and they will likely be insulin resistant per that standard test. So their fasting insulin will likely be high. Next is the lean type of PCOS. And this would include women who are either normal or underweight, and they likely will not show up as insulin resistant per the, the standard tests. But they're often insulin resistant in their fat tissue and insulin sensitive in their muscle tissue. So that's kind of what keeps them lean, is that they can easily use the insulin to grow muscle and even the excess male hormones, if that's applicable for in their situation, to grow muscle and be leaner and their fat tissue, they won't accumulate fat tissue as easily because the fat tissue will actually be um, insulin resistant. The next type that you may hear about is post-pill PCOS, and this is basically when you've been on the pill, especially for an extended period of time, and you come off and your hormones are kind of all over the place, and you can have sort of a PCOS type profile. and a lot of times that gets better with time, but not always. So that's another type of PCOS that you might hear about. And then lastly, this one sometimes ties into the lean PCOS type, but doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to, but it's adrenal PCOS. And this is where a woman has high DHEAS, which is a male hormone produced by the adrenal glands, as opposed to high testosterone. So testosterone is produced in the ovaries and a little bit in the adrenal glands and other tissues as well, but DHEAS is just produced in the adrenal glands. And this is usually the result of too much stress in the body somewhere. So how can these underlying causes be 
treated naturally if we don't want to just go the conventional route and treat the symptoms and we want to get to the, the root causes. So the big answer is that it, it depends. So it depends on the individual woman and what the causes are for her and then her other health issues that she may be experiencing and what her hormonal profile looks like. But in general, um, I'll break down to categories. So the first would be diet. So focusing mostly on whole foods is very beneficial. I mean, just for health and hormone balance in general, but especially if you have PCOS. And then along with that, um, focusing on healthy fats. So avocado, coconut oil, grass-fed butter or ghee, egg yolks, fattier cuts of quality meats. And when I say quality meats, I mean things like grass-fed beef and lamb, pasture chicken, turkey, and pork. Um, and then other protein sources to include would be pastured eggs and wild-caught fish. So those are all really great for PCOS. And then of course your, your fruits and veggies as well. Um, and then the next category would be exercise. So one thing that's really great for PCOS is building muscle. So that can really help with improving insulin sensitivity, which again, as I mentioned, is usually present to some degree in all women with PCOS. And then the, the next component of exercise that can help is not doing excessive cardio or really long duration workouts um, because that will, doing those types of exercises will increase your cortisol levels and therefore inflammation. And especially if you have the adrenal type of PCOS, you want to minimize that type of stress on your body because that will just make the, your DHEAS levels increase. And then the next one, which is huge, which I've talked about before, is sleep. So sleep, as we all know, is important for overall health in general and super important for hormone balance. But especially if you have a condition like PCOS, it's really, really important to get quality sleep. And then lastly would be supplements. So some common ones would be inositol. So that can help improve insulin sensitivity. It's usually in a, a powdered form or um, capsule. Um, also spearmint tea. So that's been shown in studies to reduce androgen levels. So that can also help with PCOS. Then we have magnesium, which is an awesome supplement overall. Most people are deficient in it. So it can be really helpful for a number of different health conditions. But this um, supplement improves insulin sensitivity it promotes stress reduction and improved sleep, which I mentioned is really important for PCOS, especially the adrenal type of PCOS. And then it also reduces inflammation, which again is present in to, to some degree in most women with PCOS. Um, next would be probiotics. So these can improve gut health, which can really help to balance out hormones in the body. And there are also some other vitamins and minerals that are commonly lacking in PCOS that you may want to look into supplementing or maybe just including more foods that have these nutrients. So some of those would be iodine, selenium, B vitamins, chromium, zinc, and CoQ10. Now there are also various herbs that can be very effective in PCOS, but you do have to be a bit cautious with herbs because it depends on your specific hormone profile. So I would say for herbs, I won't get into the specifics of herbs right now, but it's usually best to work with a healthcare practitioner or someone who is familiar with exactly how they work and also familiar with your unique situation and hormone levels. So that's all I have for you today. Those are the basics and the overview of PCOS. Um, again, if you have any questions, just let me know in the comments or send me a message and I'll be happy to get back to you. I also have a private Facebook group. It's called Hormone Balancing, Fertility, and Beyond. So if you're interested in this type of content and you're not already a member, I invite you to join that group. It's, it's a great group of women and I share a lot of information about women's health in there. And I will post a link to that group in the comments if you want to join. I also have a free guide on my website with my top five tips for hormonal health. So I will post the link to that. Um, it's on the homepage of my website. Just put in your, your name and email and you'll get access to that. 
And if you want some, some more support and someone to guide you in helping to naturally balance your hormones, I do also offer free consultations. So I'll put a link to sign up for that in the comments. So that is all. Thank you for joining me and have a great day.